Good morning. I'd like to thank Dr. Lee for inviting me to be a part of this incredible forum. And I'd like to say thank you to all of those of you in attendance for giving me your time today to speak a little bit about the current state of the Fontan completion and really what's on the horizon. My name is Mary Ibarra. I'm an assistant professor of pediatrics at the Washington University in St. Louis. I received my formal training not only in pediatric cardiology, but also advanced cardiac support in heart transplantation in children. And I am the current director of the Comprehensive Fontan Clinic. When Dr. Lee asked me to speak to you all, uh, I thought that this would be somewhat easy to put together. However, in being a little bit more thoughtful about addressing family members of someone with hypoplastic left heart syndrome or Fontan completion, uh, it proved to be a little more challenging than I anticipated uh, because I realized that a lot of what we learn and a lot of what we're investigating is looking at the things that could go wrong or the things that have gone wrong in the past. And we're looking at ways to prevent things and to make things better. Uh, so not particularly uplifting, um, but I will do my best to not make it uh, so drab. Um, I also do not have a whole lot of slides. It's really more so um, just kind of discussion about where we're going from here. Um, but I did put up a few things that I thought would be important. So as recent uh, as the 1980s, hypoplastic left heart syndrome was considered uniformly fatal in infancy. The evolution of diagnostic testing, palliative and reconstructive cardiac operations has had an enormous impact on the life expectancy uh, and quality of life of such patients and their families. For example, fetal detection of hypoplastic left heart syndrome and its variants has increased from 33% in the early 2000s to nearly 75% only 10 years later. And while it's helpful to have that information ahead of time, I think the more important piece is knowing what to do about it. Uh, while surgical techniques, um, like, like you see on the screen here, uh, such as the Norwood operation or the Fontan palliation, were being created and utilized in various anatomical abnormalities back in the 60s. It wasn't until 1983 that the Norwood procedure was more consistently utilized for single ventricle physiology as a temporary stabilizing measure in neonates or newborns. Uh, this was obviously huge uh, for these babies as it, as it bought them time, it bought families a chance um, at, at having life. Since the consistent use of the Fontan uh, palliative procedure, there have been no real major new developments in surgical techniques for single ventricles. Uh, surgeons have gone back in time and taken from previous experiences and utilized techniques that were typically used for other structural abnormalities. Um, but there's not been anything really new um, in terms of strategy for, for single ventricles. And so as the surgical technique uh, and the perioperative management has improved over the years, patients are now surviving further into adulthood. We're currently approaching a 30 year survival rate of greater than 80%. And with that, we now have more information, more observations, more analyses to help further understand this patient population and its extreme diversity. As a result, clinicians instead have chosen to focus on other aspects such as surveillance uh, and, and identifying how do we improve the quality and how do we improve duration of life. And so what does this look like? How are we achieving these, uh, these aspirations? Um, for one, we as a medical community have developed collaborative networks. Uh, these networks consist of clinical research hospitals, data coordinating centers. Um, there's always a supporting body um, or a or funding body like the National Institute of Health. Um, and the networks serve to not only collect data, uh, but they share research ideas, they develop protocols, they disseminate whatever findings that we have. Um, and because the prevalence of single ventricle anatomy is so low, finding meaningful trends or observations at a single institution is, is challenging. Uh, so collaboration across the country to collect as much information as possible helps to produce meaningful change. Uh, as an example, here I have listed the Pediatric Heart Network. Uh, this was established in 2001, so fairly young, um, it is one such network. Um, they've actually completed two observational studies within the Fontan population, um, which 
which really laid the groundwork for, for what we're doing now. Um, the first study looked at 546 patients between the ages of 6 and 18 years of age who had Fontan surgery, and this was across the country, only 546 patients. And so essentially what they did was they looked at all of these kids and they described uh, was that the majority of these children had physical capacity that was less than children without congenital heart disease, but they still considered it to be within a normal range. They did a second study as a follow-up to this um, of the same 546 kids. Um, they, they, they did a reevaluation six years later, and what they found was there was no real change. Uh, most of these kids still had relatively normal physical functioning or mental functioning um, despite having a single ventricle. Now, these studies did not give us specific guidelines. They did not give us any sort of management strategies, uh, but they did tell us important observations. Um, because of the relatively short history of consistent outcomes of the Fontan palliation for single ventricle and the variety of single ventricle morphology, we are just now uh, starting to understand or starting to unravel the complexity uh, of the Fontan circulation uh, and the impact that it has on the body as a whole. Um, we are exploring those patients that have had good long-term success with Fontan palliation. We're, we're trying to understand why were they successful, um, but we're also looking at those that are perhaps struggling along the way to try and better understand how to help these particular patients. Over the last 10 years, uh, some of the congenital heart disease programs um, have recognized that the single ventricle population is, is extraordinary in that way, um, in, in that they need special um, special physicians and outside of cardiology. Um, and as such, this is where they began the development of these comprehensive programs or comprehensive clinics that allow for various assessments, um, kind of like a, like a one-stop shop, um, to address the individual comprehensive needs um, for these patients. Here at St. Louis Children's Hospital, we've also progressed um, in this manner to developing a clinic that allows our patients to come in on one day and see various subspecialists. Um, and then at the end of the day, um, we clinicians get to sit down and discuss um, each individual patient and, and really give an overall health assessment of, of, of a patient with the Fontan circulation. You'll hear um, a little more today from Drs. Barger and Drs. Lindley um, in regards to the advances that have been made in understanding um, and managing protein losing enteropathy, which is a common manifestation found in our Fontan population, um, as well as managing pregnancy in our female population. And so I would actually like to go over and describe for you some of the other entities that we are focused on in the medical community uh, to help improve and enhance the quality and duration of life of a child or young adult with Fontan circulation. One of the hot topics um, is the Fontan-associated liver disease. We now know that as a result of the lack of a pumping chamber to move blood through the liver to the lungs to receive oxygen, the liver will become congested. This increase in congestion translates to increased pressure, which causes tissue injury, some inflammation, um, and ultimately fibrosis, uh, which can be present as early as five years post-Fontan completion. Um, oftentimes this congestion or, or fibrosis can be stagnant for many, many years, and other times it can progress. Um, some of the more severe uh, and rare complications that can manifest over time include cirrhosis of the liver. Um, some patients can develop bulging of the blood vessels that are kind of in and around the liver that extend into the esophagus, known as varices. Um, and in some of the more uh, severe cases, and, and oftentimes the worst case scenario, uh, they can go on to develop a hepatocellular carcinoma. Now, you know, we know this to be the natural long-term progression over the span of, you know, 30 years for a very small percent of patients. Um, but we are still now more diligent about monitoring patients um, with laboratory assessments, with abdominal imaging, uh, both with uh, ultrasound imaging and um, with uh, CT imaging. 
Um, and over the last several years, uh, something called elastography has been used to evaluate the degree of fibrosis or the degree of stiffness uh, within the liver. Um, this can be done both with um, ultrasound or with MRI. Um, and it's become quite popular among our liver colleagues or our hepatology, hepatology team um, who are intimately involved in our comprehensive valuation. In addition to the imaging, there's currently um, active studies that are aimed to evaluate the effects of certain medications on the development or progression of Fontan associated liver disease. Um, I'm going to circle back to this topic in a little bit, um, but I do want to move on to some other things that um, are important um, in terms of kind of moving forward with the Fontan. Um, as someone who specializes in heart failure, advanced cardiac support and transplant, I, I really couldn't go by without talking about uh, this topic uh, as it relates to our Fontan patients. Um, I think as a whole, we're all very fixed to the idea that one pumping chamber, um, it's inevitable that this pump will eventually have some dysfunction or even fail. Um, and how or when that happens is the big question and is not clear. Um, as you all know, um, you know echocardiography is, is quite important for us um, and, it, and it is the first line method of assessing function um, in our patients. We can look at these images side by side and we can look and see, you know, visually has there been a change um, from one visit to the next in the squeeze of the ventricle? Uh, sometimes this isn't enough. Um, sometimes it's not quite accurate. And so uh, cardiac MRI is also very helpful. Um, you can get uh, an, at, an accurate assessment of ejection fraction. You can get flow information. You can get regurgitation or leaking valve. And you can get an assessment of that through cardiac MRI. Um, and it's slowly coming around to be more favored um, in pediatric cardiology. Uh, it's certainly more accessible in the adult population. Um, however, I think for the younger population, we can gain a lot of good information from this, this modality without um, excessive radiation um, um, and, and with a little bit more clarity. There are some circumstances where the ejection fraction is completely normal, um, but the patient has symptoms of heart failure. Uh, the patient's, you know, exercise intolerant, or they've got slow growth or growth that trajectory that's kind of slowly declining. Um, they're more fatigued. Um, some patients um, and some kids will develop, um, you know, fluid in their belly, um, which is called ascites, um, PLE, or even liver cirrhosis. Um, and we can do our best to manage these symptoms um, with, with medical therapy, with, with prescription medications, um, and hope that uh, we do the best to, to make them feel better. Um, if there's a rhythm problem that's leading to more problems, we can treat, um, hopefully treat those rhythm issues and, and we can see some recovery of, of function and reversal of some of these symptoms. But there are certain circumstances in which we can't and at some point we need to provide support in an alternative fashion. And sometimes that can be addressed with heart transplantation. It certainly isn't a cure. Um, you're replacing one disease process with another, but it does buy more quality time. And oftentimes um, these patients can return to completely normal function with improvement in their PLE, improvement in their kidney function, improved energy levels, growth. Um, more recently, we've done some studies to look at um, some of the other uh, uh, associated conditions um, and have seen that fibrosis on our imaging of our, of our livers um, can actually be reversed um, after heart transplant. Um, you know, we're not sure about the more advanced fibrosis, cirrhosis. I'm not really certain we've reached that point in time where we can decide that, that that's helpful. Um, but certainly for the lesser degree, we can see some reversal of that damage. Um, but heart transplantation is not for everyone. It's a limited resource and patients um, have to undergo a very rigorous and thorough evaluation to ensure the most likelihood for success after transplant. And for other families, um, it's not something they would consider for more personal reasons. Um, and so unfortunately at this time, we have very limited other mechanical circulatory support options. Um, more common uh, in, in the adult practice or in the adult-sized children, um, we do have uh, something 
uh, called a ventricular assist device, um, which uh, can be used to help support uh, a failing heart. Um, in systolic heart failure, these, these devices are durable enough that oftentimes patients will go home with them. Some adults return to work, go back to exercise, um, and, and they keep these devices either as a permanent device or um, as a bridge to transplant. Um, it's still not a frequent practice to use this type of support in children with single ventricle configurations. Um, we have had some success with this kind of support in, in certain circumstances. Other centers have also reported success, um, but it, it is still um, under investigation. And some of our international colleagues um, have described using these kinds of devices in Fontan with, with variable success. Um, so this is really kind of the forefront of where we're headed for, um, for support for those that might be struggling. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the Pediatric Heart Network found that children with Fontaine's had some diminished exercise capacity when compared to children without congenital heart disease. Um, and this was important to note because this diminished exercise capacity, um, if progressive over time, can actually be an indicator of potential problems. Um, poor nutrition, poor wound healing, um, something called frailty, um, hypertension, diabetes, all of these things add up against any patient. Uh, but more so in patients with congenital heart disease. Uh, children and adults with Fontan circulation um, will have what we call reduced peak exercise capacity. So we'll put them on a treadmill and, and see what's the most that they can exercise. Um, and, and naturally, it's a little bit reduced. Um, but increasing evidence suggests that exercise training may improve exercise capacity and cardiovascular function. Um, some centers across the country have been looking at specific exercise training programs um, in other congenital heart disease patients and have found there to be quite a bit of benefit um, and thought perhaps this was relatable to all congenital heart disease patients. Um, unfortunately, these studies that are completed all have very, very small numbers and there's multiple variables. They don't all use the same um, training protocol and they use different different types of congenital heart disease, um, but all suggest that some type of exercise training benefit patients with Fontans. Um, and that some patients not only had improved exercise capacity, but also had improved cardiac function and improved quality of life. So again, small studies, variable programs, there's real no consensus yet as to you know what, what is the best method and what provides the most benefit. Um, so we, we here at Children's, um, along with other larger congenital heart disease programs throughout the country, are pushing for the development of cardiovascular rehabilitation programs for children with, with either congenital or acquired heart disease in hopes that this may actually um, improve quality of life and also improve function and, and, get, and kind of increase the longevity. longevity. Additional issues that we encounter from our Fontan patients, um, including renal dysfunction. Um, I'm gonna to touch briefly upon this one only because it is a big deal. The kidneys receive 25% of our cardiac output at rest. Um, and with one ventricle, this is undoubtedly going to be compromised at some point. Um, however, there's not a whole lot of information about what is the most accurate way to measure kidney function at this point. Um, and, and the general consensus is that it's important for these patients to stay hydrated, to keep blood pressure under control, to manage blood sugar levels, um, and to avoid any prolonged use of medications that can um, further impair renal function, um, like NSAIDs or ibuprofen. So, so the key here really is just protecting our kidneys the best that we can um, until more information can be, can be learned um, about, about, uh, about the renal function. Uh, neurological, uh, neurodevelopmental, and behavioral abnormalities have also emerged as being important comorbidities in any patient with congenital heart disease. I think over the last 10 years, there's been a significant push to understand um, neurodevelopment in kids with congenital heart disease, um, recognition uh, and management of the neuropsychological and behavioral impairments that affects many of our patients has been really important. Um, there's implications for patient education, medical adherence, 
um, and the ability to transition from pediatric to adult care. Um, so really the, the most important piece here is early and routine screening to identify these deficits to allow for introduction or continuation of the appropriate therapies um, to optimize education and, and increase any opportunities that we have there. The study uh, and improvement of the health and quality of life for patients with Fontan circulation really is twofold. Uh, one, I believe that the medical community needs to continue these collaborative measures to harmonize protocols, obtain meaningful data about the outcomes of procedures or management strategies, and to continue to share these outcomes, both good and bad, um, with centers across the country. Um, and even with our international colleagues to find any solution to the problems uh, for this small but growing population. Um, our newest network, the Action Learning Network, uh, has started incorporating protocols for nationwide distribution to, to harmonize some of our advanced cardiac therapies and to produce these kinds of meaningful outcomes. Um, it's been helpful to teach centers, um, you know, ways that have uh, improved outcomes, and it also has provided learning tools to distribute to families to help them better understand, um, you know, the changes that we are making along the way. And two, we need to maintain optimism and hope for the future by encouraging self-determination, by planning, um, along with these kinds of realistic dialogues, uh, which aim for improving health outcomes. Um, we need to maintain a really good therapeutic relationship, um, and I think we need to be able to exchange as much information um, in a respectful manner uh, that, one, fosters um, a way to, for families to reach out and ask more questions and do investigations, but then, two, to also receive the appropriate information and to receive um, uh, information that's accurate uh, so, so that we can work together to hopefully uh, life improvement and management strategies uh, for patients with Fontans. Thank you all very much for your attention um, and I'm happy to entertain questions um, in the question and answer session.